God! Sheila! Come on, my boy. Today's the day. I've got your stuff all laid out. Gonna be a nice day. Oh, God. Oh, Dad, it's seven o'clock. It's gonna take me five hours to get ready. You wanna look your best, don't you? You can't get married looking like a scroff. I remember the day I married your mother, God rest her. I had this bloody collar. Morning. Morning. No need to, you know. I can look after myself. I know you can look after yourself. I just thought it would cheer you up. Who says I need cheering up? I do. Yeah. Nothing the matter with me? Well, if it makes you feel any better, think of breakfast as a bribe. Oh, the ulterior motive. Which is? The morning walk. This is not a boarding kennels. He's your dog. He's your responsibility. Ned's dog. And it's a she, remember? I can't go out looking like this. What would my public think? Please, for me. Do we have a deal? Today, Mrs. Fanshaw. Oh my, what a lovely day we're going to have. I always say a fine day raises the spirits. I'm just going to do your observations. Did we have a good night? Did we dream? I can see you later, then you can tell me all about your dreams. Oh, morning, Doctor. Morning. How does she seem today? Same as ever, really. Hmm? Well, not quite the same. All the uh, indications are. Uh... Ah. Well, that's interesting. Has there been any movement? Fingers, for example? I didn't notice. Well, please try and notice. OK. Tell Sister I want to check every 15 minutes now. Perhaps today is the day that Mrs. Fanshawe rejoins us. Well, what do we say if she asks, you know? Don't tell her anything. You leave that to me. Dog. She's got a name, Dad. Clytemnestra. Well, wow, she better not have any puppies. I ever not. You read your Greek tragedy, girl. Physician, heal thyself. Jolyon, how's the private sector, hmm? Doing my bit for the public sector today, as a matter of fact. Has the uh, sleeping beauty come round here? Like I said, it's only a matter of time. You still offer squash at lunchtime? Loser puts a fiver in the appeal fund. It's a deal.
Mr. Pertwee? Oh, hello, it's Lillian Hatton here. Yes, yes, it is a lovely day. Listen, can I speak to Jack, please? It's about Charlie. It's Lillian for you. Hello, Lillian. What's old Charlie up to now? Charlie. It was all right last night in a pub. You can't get married without the best man, Jack. Well, never mind that. What's happened to him? <laughs> get that dog of yours on a lead. Oh, he must have fallen in. Maybe. Get that dog under control. He was drunk last night, but then you generally are at stag night, aren't you? You know him. You can't see his face, how do you know him? You better call the police, they'll tell Jack. I am the police. How do you know who he is? Well, I'd know him anywhere. That's Charlie Hatton. He was going to be Jack's best man. You took your time. Let's see Mrs. Hatton first. I'll take her. I'll drop you off at Jack Pertley, the bridegroom. Apparently, the uh, dead man was not only the best man, but the best friend from childhood. Seems Mr. Pertley took the news very badly. Great. Oh, we can do it the other way around if you like. That's OK, thanks. Never got used to it, telling women they're widows. Oh, do you think I have? said it was unlucky to wear green at weddings. She said it when we were choosing her dress. It's a lovely dress. A real wedding dress. Get Mrs. Hatton a cup of tea. Mrs. Hatton. What did your husband do for a living? What? His job. What did he do? Charlie. Oh, he's an electronics engineer. He works at Blackstaff's on the estate. He travels all over the... That's what you said. That'd be true. You've 
made a mistake. You must have. Not Charlie. No, no, not Charlie. <laughs> Police don't make mistakes like that, son. Jack and Charlie are his best friends. School together all them years ago. And then they never changed. You, you couldn't get closer than them. Hey, Jack, listen, you, you, you'll have to speak to Marilyn. <laughs> yes, you will. And Lillian, you know, Charlie's wife. Um, Marilyn's her best friend. <laughs> they was all going to be so happy together. But well, you have to call it off. The wedding, I mean. You answer the gentleman's questions. Look, I'll, I'll phone Marilyn, and you can talk to her yourself. Mr. Pertwee, Jack, I mean. When did you last see Mr. Hatton? See Charlie. Hello. Is Marilyn there? Outside the pub. Is Jack's dad? Last night, outside the pub. Said he was going home and went off towards the footpath over to Kingsbrook. Which part? The William the Fourth? About 10.30. There was a group of you, four or five. That's right. How do you know that? my pocket than he earns in a month. Ah, he's not kidding. My mate Charlie never kids. Hey, you know what he's bought me in Maryland for present? A wedding present. Yeah, you told us already. One of the best stereos you can get. One of them sweetest jobs. Cost a thousand quid, don't they, Charlie? Nothing but the best for my old mate. Even if the music he puts on it is enough to make you throw up. Be I am sure. Be I buggery. I be up from where I'm. Problem? No problem, sir. Just high spirits, that's all. Good night. Good night, sir. I was uh, driving home. I may have been the last person to see him. On his way. Go on. Say it. On his way to die. safe now. We're looking after you. All right, then.
Ferris. I'm visiting Mrs. Wexford. There's no news, is there? Afraid not. Thank you. Mr. Wexford, you're a policeman, aren't you? Yes. Why'd you ask? I... Oh, no reason, really. Well, if you'll excuse me. I meant to get you some flowers, but I didn't get round to it. Ed, you don't have to bring something every single day. In fact, you don't need to come in every day. I know you're busy. Well, I shouldn't be that busy. I am not made of glass, Reg. I won't break. Oh, darling. A hysterectomy is a major operation. Yes. Well, it all went very well, remember? I'll be out of here soon. Has the doctor said anything? Well, I don't think there's been much change in my condition since yesterday, Reg. Well, I'm not silly. I realize that. Are you all right? Sorry. I took that blasted dog out for a walk this morning and found a dead man. Do you realize it's the first time that I've actually found a body? Well, it, it shakes you. It really does. Well, it must. Just floating on the water. Like something thrown away. Excuse me. It is Chief Inspector Wexford, isn't it? Yes. Could I have a word for a moment? Yes? Oh, no, it's nothing to do with Mrs. Wexford. It's a different matter. Oh. the other night, what you were saying. Hey, I thought we agreed we weren't going to discuss that for a couple of days. Yeah, I know, I know, but, um... Look, Mike, I told you, I need time to think this over. The man Reg found in the river this morning. Turns out he was due to be best man of the wedding today. How is Reg? Well, finding a dead body can't be much fun. No, I meant the way he's been behaving. No, I know, I know, he's just the same, snapping away at the least thing. I mean, I know Dora's in hospital, but these past few days... Poor old Mike. Between me and Reg. Oh, I can cope with him. It's not him, I won't worry. Yes, well, I sometimes wonder whether you're not married to Reg in some way. Look, Mike, I've got to think about what I'd be taking on. Your job is part of that. So are Pat and John. Jean, too, for that matter. But Jean's in the past. Is she? Very well, yes, I do love Jean. I'll always love her, but... The grief and the unhappiness are in the past. But that's why I can love you. I'm in love with you. <clears throat> yes? Message from the chief, sir. He's going to be delayed at the hospital and wonders if you can go to Blackstaff yourself. Yes, OK. What's the problem at the hospital? Sir? Is Mrs Wexford all right? He didn't say, sir. And uh, I didn't like to ask him. OK, thanks. As I was saying... I know what you were saying. Really. I meant it. Bloody Martin, of all the moments. <laughs> Sister felt you should be told as soon as possible. Please accept my sympathy, Mrs. Fanshawe. Yes. He always drove too fast. I said to him, Oh, Jerome. Jerome, my husband, he always.
always drove much too fast. And he refused to wear a seatbelt. He always said it was up to him. Not some damned official what he did in his car. Your daughter was in the back seat. <laughs> Sorry, Mrs. Fanshawe. It wasn't just your husband. Jerome! I know! I know! Your daughter also died in the crash. No, no, that's wrong. Laura's not dead. Not like him. Jerome. Your husband was driving. You were found in the passenger seat. Your daughter was in the back seat. No, no, you don't understand, do you? My daughter wasn't with us. She wasn't in the car. Nora wasn't there. She'd gone, you see. Around. Only to be expected, I suppose. Poor bloody woman. Thank you. You have to drive anybody off their chump being faced with a thing like that. Well, it's not uncommon. She's got everything in working order, except for areas of selective amnesia, traumatically induced. So she can cope with the death of her husband, but she can't cope with the death of her daughter. So she denies her daughter was even there. Mind you, she seemed awfully sure. Some things she's going to remember and other things she's going to forget. That's what I mean by selective amnesia. I hear the prince got to the sleeping beauty. Oh, sorry. You won't forget that fiver for the appeal fund, will you? What did he mean by the sleeping beauty? Oh, um, one of Mr. Vigo's little jokes. Being in private medicine, he has the time to think them up. Now, give us 24 hours. I'll put on some new medication, run some tests, and see what she says then. OK. All right, Mrs. Wexford? Yes, thank you. Fancies you? Nonsense. Old man like me. Well, I fancy you. Is that nonsense? Well, it's different. Don't be so stuffy. You should be pleased that you can still turn a young girl's head. Would you be pleased if she turned mine? What did you say to that poor woman? The one the sister spoke to you about? No. What could I say? Second time today I've had to tell somebody she's a widow. Well, she said to me that's the problem. What do you mean? Never mind. It's you I came to see. Well, I hate to be ungrateful, but isn't it time you were getting back to your work? Oh, hello, Mike. How are you? OK, thanks. <laughs> you? Well, looking after him's no picnic, but apart from that, fine. <laughs> Jenny and I saw the film. You were very good. Oh, thank you. Hello, Mike. Well, I'll leave you in peace. I've got a date. I'll pop in and see Mum later, and I'll take Clytemnestra. Well, don't let that dog find any more dead bodies. We had enough trouble with this morning's catch. Clytemnestra? <laughs> Rover was good enough in my day. Well, take your coat off. Sit down. Well, where are we? Who did you talk to? Quite a few. I um, phoned Charlie Hatton's boss at Blackstaff's. And then I saw George Carter. He's a friend of Jack Pertwee's. He was there at the pub last night. And then uh, the barman at the pub and P.C. Woods. He's the one who moved them on after they came out. Did you talk to Cullum, who turned up at the river this morning? He was in the pub last night. I thought you'd want to be in on that. Now, do we see a pattern emerging? I think we might be. That's me off, me and the dog. I'll be back to make dinner. Off where?
I've got an appointment with Mr. Vigo. Oh. Surgery is at the back. There is a notice. And you'll have to leave your dog in the car. It's not allowed in the surgery. I was just admiring your house. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yes, it is. Everyone says that. I see. I see what your camera chat means. For 99% of us, it's insignificant. But if you're an actress and doing one of those big close-ups, happened when you were a child, I should think. Boisterous brother, perhaps. Sister, actually. Ah, the female of the species. Deadlier than the male. People always remember things differently. You can't expect accounts to tally. Yeah, but the difference is here. I mean, George Carter tells a quite different story to Jack Pertwee. That's all I know much about. Come on, down in one. To me, they're all the same. No. To me, they're all the same. Did you see your first time in the West? Will you? Yeah. That was one of the best. Right. The party starts now. Yeah. Show yeah. 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 You took your time. Yeah. Yeah. Did you miss it, did you? What you want to drink, Charlie? Do you know that, Jack? Maurice Cullen buying somebody a drink. What'd you do? Steal your old woman's housekeeping? Scotch. Make it a double. And you get your pennies out as well, George Carter. Next round's on you. Steve! Large scotch. Hey, you're right. Doesn't fit, does it? According to uh, Carter, Charlie couldn't open his mouth without insulting somebody. But from what Jack Pertwee said to you this morning, everybody loved him. Warm, generous Charlie. The only thing they agree on is this business of the money. It's great to see you, Charlie. You're looking well. And I'm doing well. Next round's on me! Yay! Yay! Yeah. Every one of 20. Inside. Every one of 50. Charlie Atten comes prepared. Charlie is our darling. Double scotches all round. What you make of it? Well, I think we should start with the money. As a motive, I mean. Murder in the course of robbery. Certainly looks that way. Still. What? Well, it's the sheer amount of money that I can't square. Charlie Hatton was a maintenance engineer for the systems that Blackstaff installs. I mean, what would he earn? I don't know, a couple of hundred quid a week? Well, not more. And that house, believe me, Mike, it had everything that money could buy. Well, all the more reason to have a talk with Mr. Cullum. He's the one who got his nose rubbed in the money. No. I'd rather have the result of the PM first. Is McNaughton still on leave? Uh, yes, it was Len Crocker I spoke to this morning. How's Dora? Oh, she's fine. Fine. The delay at the hospital. Oh, that was something else. She seemed so sure. Who did? What? Oh, uh, Dr. Crocker, please. Mrs. Fanshawe's just regained consciousness. Who? Mrs. Fanshawe. Husband and daughter killed uh, in that car crash. On the bypass some weeks ago. Oh, yes, I remember. Oh, hello. You have a car reserved for me? It was booked in Brussels along with my air ticket. Mm -hmm. Just a moment. What's your name, please? Fanshawe. F A N S H A W E. Nora Fanshawe. Perfectly healthy bloke. Ah, oh, the fact that he's dead. Well, it wasn't an accident. Not that such a thought ever entered your evil minds. Somebody walloped him. Two or three times. I wanted to make quite sure that Mr. Hatton had definitely departed this Vale of Tears. Weapon? Oh, I'd like to swear. A flat, heavy stone, I'd imagine. There were traces of river moss in the hair. Could have come from just being in the water, but it's unlikely. Do you know what time it happened? Is it crucial? Not yet. Sometime between 11 and 12 would be my best guess, but uh, don't lean on the edges. Talking of leaning on someone. Patience, Mike. Patience. Step by step. You're always quoting procedure at me. Thanks, Len. Come on. Don't you want to hear the interesting bit? What? 
Somebody did a lovely job on your friend, Charlie. Get on with it. You used to enjoy being teased, Reg. You must be getting old. Come on. Plastic surgery. Birthmark on the face. It's gone now, but as I say, a very professional job. We'll get out of here. Would that have been expensive? Well, the NHS wouldn't cover it. What did you do for a living? Uh, he was a service engineer, electronics. Well, he must have been saving his pennies for quite a while. Yes, I know, Reg, but these things take time. They have to do all sorts of tests. Still haven't told Dora, have you? She'd worry herself sick if she thought they were doing a biopsy. Better let her think she's fine. She is fine. She's making a perfectly good recovery from the hysterectomy. Except for what they found when they did it. Chances are it's not malignant. Have you told Sheila? Or Sylvia? Taking it all on yourself. Not a good idea, Reg. I can cope. That's Jack Pertwee. I asked him to come in and make a statement. I want to talk to him. Uh, Mr. Pertwee. Chief Inspector Wexford, I'm in charge of this case. You've got him yet? Oh, early days. Have you got any idea who it was did it? My fiance. Marilyn Thompson. How'd you do? We've just been hearing about Charlie Hutton's face, that disfigurement. Yeah. Strawberry mark. <laughs> Poor little beggar. Used to get bullied about it when he was at school. Kids. But you didn't join in. Well, I put a stop to it, no danger. Didn't bother Charlie after I thumped him a few times. Tell me, did you make friends with him, or was it the other way around? I don't know. He made friends with me, I suppose. I don't really recall. What's this got to do with Charlie's murder? Well, it might have some bearing. You never know. Early days. I can't hear myself think with all this damned racket. Why do we need a new security system anyway? It's half past four. I'll finish up for the day in a few moments. The scene of crime boy just brought this in, sir. We found it in the water. There are prints, but... Hopeless. Is there any money in it? Nope. Did you check inside? There's another pocket. Nothing at all, sir. Well? I know. I know. Cullum. Where'd he get it from? That's what nags at me. Where did Charlie Hatton get his money from? I'm beginning to get a picture of Charlie Hatton. Small, undersized nearly, almost disfigured until he had plastic surgery, which is costly. So where'd he get the money from? Sharp tongue to deal with insults. Probably bullied at school, so he has to cultivate a big, quiet chap like Jack Pertwee to be his friend and protector. But he still always feels superior. He's still always the manipulator. Now, where does he get the money from? He, he could have won the pool, sir. The whole world would have known about it if he had. No. Mike, get down to the bank. I want to know all about Charlie Hutton's accounts. Now, you still ought to be able to catch him. I thought this damn racket was going to stop at 4.30. So did I. We're working around the clock, sir. Chief Constable gave special authorization. I'd better get going. I promised to make dinner for him. If it's not Is ready... Is he giving you a hard time? <laughs> no. He's just a bit moody, that's all. Oh, I know. The way he was when he was in here earlier today. He misses you. <laughs> Maybe he thinks I'm going to be an invalid for the rest of my life. That's silly. That's men for you. <laughs> Maybe I should talk to him. Oh, no. You should know your father better than that, even though he's always had a soft spot for you. He likes to work things out for himself. Hi. Oh, hi. 
Mike Gordon phoned about five minutes ago from his house. Says he's got something interesting from the bank. I didn't expect you for another half hour. Ah, oh, well, I had to get out of that station, all that noise and banging. What's for dinner? I'm not sure. It's a recipe I found in one of Mum's cookbooks, but I couldn't find all the ingredients, so I improvised. Sounds like police work to me. Oh. Hello, Mike. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. Uh, yes, she is. Who is that speaking? Mr. Vigel. Yes, I I'll just call her. She. Mr. Vigel for you. Hello. Hi, do you have a good day? Right. Oh, um, I've got takeaways for you and John. I'm going to go out to dinner with Jenny and those friends of hers. Is that all right? Yeah, I suppose so. You can go out tonight. I meant the takeaways. Some say takeaways? Yeah. Oh, great. I'll put these in the dryer. Don't forget your keys this time. I'm going to bed early. Thanks, John. Going out with Jenny again tonight? Silly question. Toady, he's going to ask. No. He is? No. He already has. Bet you. It's ridiculous. Dad, I agree with you. For God's sake, it's not vanity. It's what other people think, what they notice. Other people? They're important. Producers, directors, cameramen, they make the decisions. But if I'm going to do more films, does your mother know why you're down here? What does she say? She says she's going to go along and see him herself after she comes out of hospital. <laughs> why didn't you tell me? Because I knew you'd react this way. And you're a bit moody anyway just now. I'm sorry. I should have told you. I know you don't like secrets. Are you all right? Yeah. Just a bit of a headache. All that hammering and banging at the station. At the station? What's it in aid of? Oh, we're putting in a new uh, security system. Though, why on earth? I wonder. Under what? I didn't phone Mike back, did I? What time did your husband get home last night? No, thank you. Quarter past eleven. How can he be so sure of the time? It was quarter past eleven. Right, come on, you lot, outside. Come on. Up there, don't you argue with me. You can watch the television later on. Now, off you go. Come on, I want to talk to these gentlemen. Now, go on, off you go. And tell that dog to stop barking. He's barking at Mrs. Brown again. And make us a cup of tea while you're out there, will you? It's been a long, hard day, Mr. Cullum. Better go sit down. Help yourself. Oh, by the way, this is Inspector Burden. What did you do after you left the William IV last night? Came home. What time? Quarter past 11. Asked the wife. She was watching a film on television. It just finished. So it took you uh, 45 minutes to get from the pub to here? I was sick. Not used to drinking all that whiskey Charlie was buying. Went in the gents down by the station. Can we see your clothes? The ones you were wearing last night? Yeah, sure. They're out here in the ironing. They've been washed? Yeah. I told you, I was sick. I made a mess of myself. What were you doing down by the river this morning, when you met the Chief Inspector? I was just going for a walk, taking the dog, like him. Just a walk? Hey, Christ, what is this? I had nothing to do with Charlie. Why do I want to kill Charlie? When we were talking this morning, you said you drove a van. Did you ever carry anything for Black Stars? You know, computer systems, so forth. Yeah, bits and pieces. That's where I met Charlie. Did you ever wonder where Charlie got his money from? He was flashing it about in the pub last night. Oh, we've talked to Jack Pertwee and George Carter. No. That's Charlie's business, not mine. He didn't put much in the bank. 
Does that suggest anything to you, Mr. Cullum? Not particularly. It is. The box and all the packing. It rained last night, didn't it? Started about two. The box was dry. So you bought a telly and a video today. You know he's watching us. Top window. Well, I should hope so. Why else do you think we're standing here? He's lying, isn't he? Oh, now he's queuing up behind his teeth. What's he lying about? That's what I want to know. What about Charlie Hatton? You can see the kind of life they lead. I think he followed Hatton home, banged him over the head and took the money. Listen, Mike, I've never known a murderer return to the scene of the crime. Not the way Morris Cullum did. First thing tomorrow, get down to Blackstaff's, get a record of all Charlie Hatton's jobs, everywhere he's been, all his jobs. I've got an idea where he's got the money from. Coffee. Thank you. I'd prefer a stiff whiskey. I know. I'm sorry. They're a really nice couple, usually. It's been half the evening each other's throats. Don't know where to look sometimes. Well, maybe they're just going through a bad patch. It does happen, you know. Oh, really? Hey. You don't think I did that deliberately, do you? I mean, took you to see them. Well, they're hardly an advertisement for the joys of second marriage, are they? For heaven's sake, Mike, I didn't know they were going to behave like that. Anyway, even if I did, I'm not that devious. I know, I know. It was a joke. Oh. Now, what about that coffee? OK. Oh, for heaven's sake. What's the matter? I forgot my keys again. Pat was going to have an early night. Look, I'd better head back. Do you mind? No, you go. I'm really sorry. Yes. Yes, all right, I'll come. Yes, right away. I'm sure. Are you suggesting she's some kind of double? Do you seriously think a mother doesn't know her own daughter? What is the problem, Chief Inspector? I mean, we thought Mrs. Fanshawe's daughter was dead and now she turns up alive and well. Do you chaps prefer dead bodies to live ones? Hmm? You must have picked up a hitchhiker. <laughs> Nurse. <laughs> Chief Inspector, please. <laughs> If Nora Fanshawe is alive and well, who was the girl in that car? And how the hell did she get there? Check it. Last night? Remember that car crash, oh, four or five weeks ago on the bypass? The man died, wife's been in a coma ever since. That's the daughter. Carry her bags any time. She wouldn't even notice you.
Miss Fanshawe? Yes? I'm Detective Chief Inspector Wexford. I'd like to arrange a time to talk to you. Oh, do join me now, Chief Inspector. Unless you've already had breakfast. Well, no. Not really. You should never let crime put you off your food. Oh, crime's not the problem. Uh, my wife's in hospital. I'll have uh, bacon and eggs and... Uh, Oh, and tomatoes, please. On my bill, room 30. Oh, that's not necessary, Miss Fanshawe. I, I'd prefer to pay for myself. Oh, don't be silly. Of course, I knew I'd seen you before. You were in the hospital last night. Visiting your wife? No. Visiting your mother. <laughs> and which is why you're here. To find out who the mysterious young lady was. The one you thought was me. I wasn't the only one who thought so. The identification was done by uh, your mother's sister. Old Aunt Patsy. <laughs> I doubt if she could identify what I've got on my plate, with or without her glasses. You working on this murder? Yeah. Was it interesting? Complicated? No, not very. Where is he? It takes longer getting himself ready in the morning than you do. It's his age, Dad. You're probably the same. Can I ask you something? Yeah, sure. Something personal. Go on. Are you and Jenny going to get married? I don't know. But you have asked her, haven't you? Did she tell you that? Come on, Dad. Jenny wouldn't do that. It's pretty obvious what's been going on with the pair of you. Yes, I have asked her, and she's um, thinking about it. Look, I would have told you before, but... I hope she says yes. Really? Dad, if we didn't like Jenny, you'd know about it by now. Just a few more questions. Why weren't you on good terms with your parents? I disliked them. I was about 16, I think, when I suddenly realised that was the problem. Different reasons in each case, but it comes to the same thing. I'm told it's far more common than people care to admit. Disliking your parents, I mean. What was their attitude to you? <laughs> Much the same. The difference was they tried to pretend otherwise. So, in the middle of December, you left your job in Brussels. On the 19th. <laughs> Goodbye, European bureaucracy. And you came back to spend Christmas with your parents at your mother's request. As I said, the intention was to uh, effect some sort of reconciliation. Which didn't work. <laughs> to put it mildly. I mean, Christmas was sort of all right, and I went up to London for New Year. But then my mother decided that the three of us should spend that cosy little weekend together in Bournemouth, and all the good work was undone. Oh? What happened? My father and I expressed our real feelings for each other. That's to say, we fought like cat and dog. And my mother took his part, as always. And you left the hotel in Bournemouth and returned to London? On January the 16th. Look, I've just explained all this to you. Is it standard police procedure to go over everything twice? Oh, I was just checking that I'd got the facts straight. Oh, you got them straight the first time. We're both too intelligent for that old routine. If I'm under some kind of suspicion, though I can't imagine of what, please feel free to check the details. Oh, and please call me Nora. Have a seat. Everything you want's in there. Somewhere. Um, you couldn't ask the computer to print out just Charlie Haddon's jobs for the past six months, could you? Save me waiting through all this. Computer's on the blink. This is a computer company. You maintain the damn things. Yeah. What you might call one of life's little ironies. Hang on. Betty? What section did Charlie Hatton work in? Uh, let's see. Section EM6. Right. Right, you want the EM6 codes. That's the one for emergency repairs. Emergency? What kind of emergency? Security systems. Well, you don't want those going on the blink for long, do you? Repairing security systems. That was Charlie Hatton's particular area of work. Yeah, maintaining and repairing it will be, yeah. All right? And almost immediately, you left the country with Mr... Oh, thank you. Jameson. Michael Jameson. 
87 Farnley Court News, SW1. He was going away to the Far East on a long business trip, and he suggested that I should go with him. And I thought, why not? He's your fiancé? This year's model, I should say. How did you uh, know about your father's death? Well, the Far East wasn't going to last forever, however much Michael wanted it to. So I thought back to Europe. Yesterday, I walked into my former boss's office, beheld everyone looking as though they'd seen a ghost, got the story, and here I am. Odd coincidence, huh? You returning on the same day as your mother regained consciousness. It's a coincidence. I don't know what makes it odd as well. But I suppose all coincidences are odd in your profession, until proven otherwise. Have you got any idea who the girl in the car was? <laughs> Search me, girl. Sergeant Martin. I want you to contact all the other forces in the South Coast. Get details of all the girls gone missing in the last six weeks, uh, especially those that fit the description and have no immediate family. Because otherwise, the alarm would have been raised long ago. Oh, no, hang on. Uh, make that eight weeks. And tell the Mr. Burden that I've gone to see Mr. Vigo. Second opinion on Charlie Hatton. Dr. Crocker, please. Oh, hello, Len. Any news? No. Yeah, thank you, Len. Yeah, bye. Ah, oh, Peter, Len Crocker. Look, do you think there's any chance of hurrying up the biopsy on Mrs. Wexford? Yes, I know, but the... the poor bloody husband's a friend of mine and he's going quietly crazy. No, no, she doesn't know. He hasn't told her yet. Hmm. Ah. Yes, I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Is Mr. Wexford in? Been and gone, sir. To see Miss Fanshawe at the hotel. What? Mrs. Fanshawe's daughter. You know, the lady in that car crash. Yes, yes, I know, but... Well, it seems that Miss Fanshawe turned up alive and well last night, which means we've got a stray corpse in our hands. Look, I need a hammer. This happened business. What are you up to? <laughs> Nothing that can't wait, sir. Good. There's some collating work to be done. Many hands make light work, as they say. Is he coming straight back, Mr. Wexford? No, sir. He's going to see Mr. Vigo. Who's he? No, sir. Thought you would. Not up with here in due course. can I tell you about Charlie Hatton? Were you expecting this visit? Well, not from you in particular, but as soon as I saw the local rag, I thought, well, jolly on, it's not often one of your patients gets himself topped. The boys in blue will be on the doorstep soon. Charlie Hatton was one of your patients? Indeed he was. Rather an unusual one, but there we are. Didn't you know? No, I didn't. I got your name from my daughter. I believe she's consulting you at the moment. Wexford, of of course, of course. Well, what's it like to be the father of a famous actress? Oh, I managed to cope with it. Actually, I came for a second opinion about the cost of plastic surgery. Cosmetic. Cosmetic. In Mr. Hatton's case, £750. Plus VAT. For the removal of a birthmark? When did he have it done? Just over a year ago, February the 23rd. You've got a very good memory, Mr. Vigo. 
As it happens, I have. But in this case, I also checked my records in anticipation of this conversation. Did he pay my check? Cash. That's unusual, isn't it? It happens. Chief Inspector, some of my patients are rather well-known people, people whose livelihoods depend on their appearance. With the tabloids busy digging up whatever dirt they can, they prefer to keep any operations quiet. And the less documentation for some nasty little journalist to turn up, the better. But Charlie Hatton wasn't one of your famous patients. Perhaps in his own eyes he was. Magnificent, isn't it? Oh, don't worry, Chief Inspector. I don't make that much. My wife inherited this house. <laughs> Would you like a drink? No, no, thank you. What did you mean when you said that Charlie Hutton was an unusual patient? Oh, poor fellow's dead. I don't really like to talk ill of him. Oh, I'll treat your comments with discretion. Please. Well, one doesn't like to be snobbish, but... He couldn't stop talking about money. He seemed obsessed with it, or rather, an obsession with how much he had in comparison to his friends. He just harped on and on. I only mentioned his wife to tell me he just bought her something new to wear. Do you know what he did for a living? Yes. At first, he just said electronics, and I thought he must have his own company or something. But I was talking about the alarm system we have, and it came out he was a sort of service engineer. I think he was rather annoyed he'd let it slip out. Don't you ever wonder how he could afford to come to you? Chief Inspector, he made it clear he could afford anything he wanted. Many irons in the fire, many fingers in the pie. He wasn't gifted with an original turn of phrase, I'm afraid, to be frank. Please. Well, he struck me as a distinctly shady character. I can't confess to total surprise when I saw the paper this morning. Ah, darling, this is Chief Inspector Wexford. My wife and my son, all of seven months. Oh, what's the matter? There we are. Isn't he splendid, eh? Aren't you? Aren't you a lovely boy? Mm -hmm. Children are a joy, aren't they, Mr. Wexford? Your first? They're always special. No, Alexander's our second child. His brother's in a special hospital. He was born rather badly handicapped. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But Alexander makes up for all that. Don't you, boy? Hey, don't you? Yes, you do. Yes. <laughs> there we are. You don't have a seat. Wax it here. Go ahead, sir. Inspector Verdon. Well, tell him to meet me in 20 minutes. Where exactly, sir? At the scene of the crime. Yeah.
Reconstruction. <laughs> Damn all to reconstruct. At least we know now what his racket was. Doctoring alarm systems. Robberies all over the place. No one thought to do a national correlation with a service company before. He didn't do them himself, though. No. He had the perfect alibis. Always off working on the other side of the country when the job was being done. What sort of sums of money were involved? Oh, thousands. And Charlie got his cut. Maybe he wanted more. Demanded an extra share of the take. And... I just wanted to say, I think it's a terrific idea. Really, it helps. And what about John? I don't know. <laughs> he doesn't say much. He might be a bit funny, but basically, I'm sure it would be fine. If you decide. Look, Pat. I want you to realise that it isn't you and John that are the problem, as far as I'm concerned. It's just that I'm... Well, I'm sort of used to being on my own, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm independent. Do you understand what I mean? I think so. Can I make a suggestion? I mean, it's none of my business, but... <laughs> yeah, come on, of course it's your business. What's the suggestion? Watch what? Oh, hello, Inspector. Mr. Carter. How are you getting on? Found out anything? Who did Charlie? Our inquiries are proceeding, sir. That's really all I can say. Is there someone we can talk? I can't tell you any more, Mr. Carter. I know, I know. It's not that. It's something I should have said before. Maybe. It probably doesn't mean anything. That's all there was. Apart from suitcases, yes, Guff. The daughters, I mean, the young woman's was lying in the middle of the road. The fan shorts were still in the boot. What was in the young woman's case? Just a few clothes, Guff. No driving license, no purse, nothing of that sort? No, Guff. Well, didn't it strike anybody as peculiar that there was no identification whatever? Well, the boys on the spot went on the assumption that... Assumption? Damn carelessness. So... We only have the aunt's word for the identification of the young woman. Well, the girl's face was badly, I mean, hitting the road. The speed Fanshawe was doing, Gov. Any sign of what caused the accident? Bad weather conditions? No, oh, it was a fine night, Gov. No frost or fog or anything like that. We just assumed that the car had gone out of control. Maybe a dog running across suddenly, or perhaps Fanshawe dozed off at the wheel. Any other drivers, witnesses? The uh, fire pass is pretty quiet at that time of night, sir. Did you set out an appeal for information? Yes, yes, Gov. Local radio. No, nothing. Do you want to see the contents of the case? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, 
expensive, those. I tried to get my sister one for her birthday, but the prices. It's not the sort of stuff that goes in an expensive handbag like that. No, sir. How could you even think of it? It was only a suggestion, no. just a thought. Well, you should know me better than that. Yes, Mike, but I didn't think you were that old-fashioned. Living together is a perfectly common arrangement. Common it may be. Do I detect a hint of snobbery? That's got nothing to do with it. What the kids would think. Well, actually... What? Nothing. See, if you want some sort of trial marriage, it means... Means what? You don't have any confidence in us. All right, Mike. Yes, I do have doubts about us. We're not exactly meeting in the middle, are we? Your life isn't going to change much. The house, the kids, your job. I mean, it's pretty much business as usual for you. It's my world that's going to be turned upside down. I've got to go to the departmental meeting first period. Hello, Jenny. How are you? In a hurry, I'm afraid, Red. Oh, how's Dora? Oh, fine. She'll be home in a few days. Oh, good. You must be missing her. Yes, I am. Bye, Mike. What papers? Legal papers, Mother! I spent the whole morning with the solicitors. They're sorting everything out, and they'll bring the papers round tomorrow for you to sign. This is some kind of a problem. Your father always said if anything happened, I'd be... I'd be well provided for. <laughs> Not unless you count being a wealthy widow as a problem. Widow? Oh, your poor father. <laughs> you can spare me the hypocrisy, Mother. That's a terrible thing to say. Is it? Then who was the girl in the car? Did he pass her off as his latest secretary? Or did he just tell you the truth about what she did for him? Nora! Oh, come on! The police will find out eventually, but you can save them the bother, can't you? Just admit it. There was no one else in the car. Why does everyone keep going on about it? <laughs> because the more fuss you make about lying to the police, the more trouble there'll be when the newspapers get hold of it. I really think your mother needs rest, Miss Fanshawe, after all she's been through. Oh, she's had plenty of practice. Her late husband's been putting her through it all her life. When you spoke to Jack Pertwee, did he say anything about this, uh... McCloy? No. But then, apparently, he wasn't in the room at that particular moment. According to Carter, he'd gone to the toilet or something. <laughs> oh, Jack getting married, eh? <laughs> for better or worse, for richer or poorer. Poorer in old Jack's case, probably. Just like you, Morris. Oh, stuff it, will you, Charlie? No, you don't want to be so sensitive, Morris. I mean, a man like you, with so many grubby little mouths to feed, he needs to say no to the wife now and again, don't he, George? They are. Oh, dear, another sensitive one. Don't worry, George. Plenty more fish in the sea. You've been seeing much of McCloy lately, Charlie. He's getting married in the morning. Ding dong, the bells are gonna chime. Kick up compass, don't lose Who's he? Compass, but get me to the church. Hey, Charlie. Oh, get me to the church. George wants to know who McCloy is. Need to shut his fat mouth. Yeah, shut up, Morris. Shut up about what? Do what my friend Jack says. Another round! Double scotches all round! What did Charlie mean when he said there were more fish in the sea? Oh, apparently Carter was engaged to be married last year, but the girl jilted him for a friend of his with better prospects. He says that's why I didn't mention it first time round. Didn't want to have to explain it all. McCloy and Charlie? Exactly my thought. And McCloy could be Charlie's associate, the man who did the robberies after he'd fixed the alarms. We ought to talk to Colin again, don't you think? Not till I've had a word with some other interested parties and you've put a team together. Yes? Detective Chief Inspector Waxford. We met yesterday, I believe. 
I remember. I'd like to speak to Mrs. Hatton. Come in. Still early days, is it? Or are you Chief Inspector? Have you got some news? Well, I'd like to ask you a few questions, if it's convenient. Mr. Pertwee, you found him yet? Bastard did Charlie in? Sorry, Lillian. Oh, we're making progress. Yeah? Well, they say most murders either get solved in two or three days, or they never do. Marilyn, heard him say that on the telly once. Isn't that right, Marilyn? On oh, a general principle, that is true, Mr. Pertwee. Uh, may I talk to you? When you get him, just let me know, will you? I'll save you all the expense of keeping him in jail the rest of his miserable life. I'm awfully glad I didn't hear you say that, sir. Mrs. Hatton? Oh, of course. Please, sit down. I would like to speak to you in private. Why? Jack and Marilyn are my best friends. I need them at a time like this. Oh, you've spent a lot of money on this house. How could your husband afford it? I beg your pardon. Well, his take-home pay was £160 a week, roughly. We know that from Blackstaff's. He also bought uh, Mr. Pertwee and his fiancée a stereo system worth well over £900 for their wedding. On the night that he died, we estimate that there was £500 in his wallet. Now, where did he get it from? But why should I know? Well, didn't you ever ask him? Weren't you at all curious about all the money he spent? No, just wait a minute. You're supposed to be finding out who killed Charlie. Not accusing him of things when he can't defend himself. We believe that Mr. Hatton's murder and his criminal activities were linked. You! Jack, don't. What exactly are you saying about my Charlie, Chief Inspector? Mrs. Hatton, we have evidence that suggests that your husband was involved through his work with uh, computer-controlled alarm systems in a series of robberies. Oh, my God. It would help us in our investigations into his death if we could search this house. What for? You think his murderer is hiding here? One possible theory is that he was killed by the men that he was involved with in these robberies. Another possibility is that he concealed some information about them here, in this house as a sort of an insurance. I can get a search warrant. Whose diary is this? Oh, it's mine. Would you mind if we borrowed it? Oh, I suppose not. Though I can't see Bloody that's police. Got... Thank you. We'll make sure it's returned as soon as possible. McCloy, next. Did you see anything on Pertwee's face? No. He doesn't know McLeod. I'll have to have a look at that diary later. There won't be anything incriminating in it. No. Not that she gave it to us that easily. I know. I've just got this feeling. What feeling? We're going around in circles.
What's your husband doing? He's working. What do you think he's doing? I'm sure you need every penny your husband can earn, Mrs. Cullen. Still, that new microwave oven must help with the meals. Look, I'll tell him you wanted to see him. Tomorrow morning at the station, Mrs. Cullen. First thing, I don't want to have to send anybody around to fetch him. All right? Penny for them. Oh, I don't think they're worth that much. <laughs> Bad day. No, not really. Just going around in circles. What are you reading? I'm finding out what you meant about Clytemnestra not having any puppies. Great tragedy. <laughs> Powerful stuff. Oh, it's all a bit unbelievable, though, isn't it? Mother and lover conspire to murder husband, and the daughter persuades the brother to get together with her to murder mother and lover. Not the sort of thing that happens in real life. Real life? Well, I must admit, this is a diary of a married woman whose sole interest in life is what she buys. It's pathetic. I don't know why people keep a diary if they've got nothing to say. Oh, loneliness, maybe. If she can't talk to her husband, then she can talk to the page. Her husband worked away from home. He was away most nights. She usually ends an entry with uh, where he is or what time he'll be back. I mean, here, January the 16th. Charlie should have been back an hour ago. Phoned when he left Guildford. Hope he's OK. Phoned AA. Road condition's good. 17th. Charlie arrived 1 AM. Seemed excited. Didn't come to bed for hours. Well, it's nice she cared so much about him. Ah. Discovered a juicy bit. The night that Charlie came back, 1 a.m., all excited. There's a connection. You what? There's a connection between Charlie Hatton and the car crash, the Fanshawe crash. A coincidence, you mean? No, I think I mean a connection. The coincidence is that Charlie Hatton died the night before Mrs. Fanshawe regained consciousness. with you, George. If you ask me, she was the latest in a long line. In a long line of what? What my father called his secretaries. Well, secretaries work in offices. Do you know much about stockbroking, Chief Inspector? They work all the time. When one market's closing, another one's opening. What my father did for a living was not a nine-to-five job. Neither was being his secretary. Useful cover. You mean they were his mistresses, that's what you're saying? And your mother was aware of this? When I was 12, he brought home a girl a secretary, and told my mother that she was going to stay with us. They had a row in front of me. My father ended the row by giving my mother 600 pounds. That was the basic pattern of their relationship. He screwed around as much as he liked and bribed her to accept it. Well, why didn't you leave her? <laughs> she was a good hostess. She kept house well and took bribes. Why should he? Well, what about her? After I got my degree, I told my mother that I could keep her, and so she could leave my father. She denied the whole business, the mistresses, I mean, and told my father to stop my allowance. Well, when you're up against that kind of thing. Uh, did he? Stop my allowance? Of course not. We were all to be paid for, wives, daughters, mistresses. It was how he related to women. There were no uh, mistresses in view when you came home for Christmas. Oh, it didn't take him long to appoint them. Your mother still denies that there was anybody in the car, apart from she and your father. Of course she does. 
Wouldn't be surprised if something's gone here. What was the uh, row about between you and your parents? When I walked out of that appalling hotel. Same old thing. My promiscuity. At least in my dear father's eyes. He irritated me about something, so I treated him to a detailed account of my recent sex life. Thank you. All this in front of Mama, naturally, and some of the other people in the dining room. Do you know what he said when I pointed out that my behaviour bore a certain resemblance to his own? It's different for men. Very good. Uh, Chief Inspector Michael Jameson. I'm being interrogated by the police. I'll see you later. You remember me telling you about Mr. Jameson? This year's model. Down hot foot from London to look after me. What more can I tell you? It's getting late. And Mr. Jameson is downstairs waiting for you. Let him. It'll be good for his character. You have very modern attitudes, don't you, Miss Fancher? I should think so. Nobody's ever going to treat me the way my father treated my mother. on your mind? Yeah, I suppose so. Okay, enough's enough. I've had nearly a week of this. What's bugging you? Bugging me? Do you know what I mean? There's a chance. How long have you and Mum known? Crocker told me the day before you came down. She doesn't know, does she? Oh, Dad, you've got to tell her. She's got a right. The tests will be true in a couple of days. That'll be time enough. For his character. It's a shambles out there. All that racket. Everything all right at the hospital? Door okay? Eh? Oh, yes, thanks. Fine. I was thinking about Mrs. Fanshawe. You know, there is some connection between that crash and Charlie Allen. I feel it, Mike. All right, all right. Where are we going to talk to Colum? Room next to the cell. Sorry about this, but as you see, the station's in a bit of a mess. What we want to know, Mr. Cullen, is where you got the money. You spent, to our knowledge, nearly 500 pounds since Charlie Adam was killed. 500 in cash. We also know what you earn. I've been saving. No, you haven't. All right, I'll tell you what you did. You'd had a gut full of that little sod Charlie Hatton that night. He made a fool of you all evening, throwing his money around, playing the big man, so you followed him. Maybe you asked him for money. 
threatened him with McCloy. And when he told you what you could do, you picked up a stone and you hit him. And then you hit him again and again. You took his money and you ran away. That's what you did. That's rubbish. This, this isn't fair. Pratt of storms, are we? So what if I am? There's nothing wrong in that. It's not the storm that bothers you. It's guilt, a guilty conscience. Washing your clothes afterwards doesn't help. We could open up the drain pipe, find traces of river mud, blood, whatever we want. Now, you tell us about McCloy. I don't know anything about McCloy. He's just a name, that's all. Well, Charlie was talking to me once. He said he was going to buy something nice for Lillian. Gonna cost a lot of money. I said, how are you gonna afford that? And he said, trust McCloy. Well, I knew it was some kind of fiddle, but... It was just a kind of catchphrase between Charlie and me, you know, trust McCloy. That... That's all I know. I just... Just told you no. know. You've been lying from the start. Believe me, I know. Now, I don't know that Mr. Burton is right. But if you don't start telling the truth now, Oi, then he must be. Oh. Well, I stole money from Charlie. The night Charlie was killed. No! No! It was in the morning, just before I met you. I was taking my dog for a walk, and I saw Charlie's wallet by the bridge. I recognised it, and I picked it up. It was empty. But I remembered that there was a little zip pocket inside. Well, that money was still there, and I took it out. And then I threw the wallet in the water. And then I let the dog off the lead, and she ran away, and I couldn't call her back. And, and that's when I met you. <laughs> Charlie had lost his wallet somewhere. I didn't know he was dead. Oh, Christ! <laughs> Tell me it's going to stop. Is it passing on? There's someone down here to caution him and take a statement. A charge of theft. Column's being arraigned at three this afternoon. We're not opposing bail, are we? No need to. Of course, you realise the significance of what he said, don't you, Mike? If the killer didn't search the wallet thoroughly, then maybe the motive wasn't robbery. It's just supposed to look that way. Exactly. And if Column hadn't done a bit of thieving, we might have gone along with it. Anything on McCloy? Martin called in 15 minutes ago. No joy yet. But I'll take some of the names on the list and check them myself after you, Raymond. Yeah, do that. Sergeant Willoughby? Oh, God, this noise. Sergeant Willoughby, any news on the missing persons, Trace?
So, this is where Fanshawe's car crashed. Discovered anything? You're mixing up two separate cases. Somebody killed Charlie Hatton? Not for money. Not just for money. There was some other reason. Okay, I agree. Not just for money. But there's still no connection between Charlie Hatton's murder and this traffic accident. Charlie Hatton arrived home late and excited on the night that the Fanshawe car crashed. Charlie Hatton died the night before Mrs. Fanshawe came out of a coma. And I asked Jenny to marry me the night before Charlie Hatton was murdered. Is that significant too? Why are you so fascinated by this crash? Well, who is she? Where does she come from? She's been dead and buried for weeks now. Nobody's come forward to say that my wife is missing or my daughter's disappeared. Bad enough to die that way, but for no one to know or care. So she dropped out of the sky. Well, uh, maybe Fanshawe did pick up some hitchhiker on the way while his wife was asleep. Maybe she fell off the back of a lorry, I don't know. All right. Plain murder. Charlie Hatton, a man we know lots about. What's the story there, then? McCloy, a mysterious Mr. McCloy, Charlie's partner in crime. Charlie tries to force McCloy into giving him a bigger cut, so McCloy kills him. Well, why shouldn't McCloy give him a bigger cut? Better than killing the goose that lays the golden egg, isn't it? Well, all right, maybe there was some other reason. When thieves fall out... Maybe Cullen wasn't telling us the whole truth. Well, perhaps he's in it too somehow. He delivered the computer equipment from Blackstar's, remember? Waxford. Message from Sergeant Willoughby. Morris Cullen has been taken to Stowart and Royal Infirmary with serious injuries. Head wounds, suspected brain damage. Suspicious circumstances. Over. Right. We're on our way. Oh, I'd like Dr. Crocker there, if possible, please. Ah, the gentleman with the law. We really can't go on a meeting like this. What happened? Well, I felt the recent crime wave was dying out, so I sneaked out of the hospital. And... No, I'm sorry. Basically, he's been very badly beaten up, mainly head injuries, including one very severe blow to the back of the head, as if his head had been thumped up against a brick wall. Or as if someone had hit him with a stone. Yes, that too. That is uh, possible. You know what Charlie Hatton looked like? Could it be the same thing? Oh, well, don't ask me to go into court with that. Not unless you've got more corroboration. Is he conscious? No. I think you have to wait some time. He's comatose, just like Mrs. Fanshawe. Another connection? You think so? No, of course not. Dr. Crane? Oh, excuse me. What this suggests is that I was right when I said that maybe Cullen knew more than he told us. So? Well, it's a reasonable assumption that somebody knows we've been questioning him and has decided to shut him up. No, that won't work. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're the detectives, but uh, even I can see that that doesn't fit. If you want to shut someone up, you kill him. You don't leave him to come out of a coma and identify whoever it was put him into it. Well, maybe Cullen's attacker thought he had killed him. I'll go and see how Martin's getting on, shall I? If they found McCloy. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Mother, I've been through all the papers with Mr. Appleby. All you have to do is sign them. I'm sure they're fine. I'm just interested, that's all, after all. I don't have your father to look after me anymore. I'm sorry to disturb you. I need to speak to Mrs. Fanshawe. Well, I'm afraid you are disturbing us. My Mr. Mother Appleby, needs... may I sign these papers tomorrow? Well, certainly, Mrs. Fanshawe. Good. I'll go through the rest of them later. I'm going to have to start looking after things for myself. You should be pleased. Come in, Chief Inspector. Good night, Mrs. Fanshawe. Good night. Mrs. Fanshawe, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to go through the details again. Oh, no. I'm sorry, but it really is necessary.
My husband had a number of these women. And I was aware of it. He was a very attractive man. He had a kind of power, authority. When he, he walked into a room, you could feel young women especially. They, But there was no one in the car. I'm not, I'm not lying. I'm not mad. I'm not, oh, what's the word they use? I'm repressing. Yes, that's right. I'm not repressing anything. I'm telling you the simple truth. Jerome and I and Nora went down to Bournemouth for a few days, just the three of us. Jerome had this terrible row with Nora. She left to go back to London and we drove back that same night, just the two of us, alone. Well, why don't you believe me? I was there. I was there when he died. When he shouted. Just before it went out of control. A fright. Why don't you believe me? I believe you, Mrs. Rancho. I think I always did. What's so special about this one? Well, it belongs to an Alan James McCloy, sir. A weekend place, apparently. We had to talk some people down the road, and he hasn't been here for a few weeks. Bit of a mystery man, they said. So what? That's what I thought, sir. Until I had a look round the back. Too much of a coincidence, isn't it? Uh-huh. Black stars. Coffee. Thanks. I thought Mum was going to throw all this stuff out. Uh, it's me you ought to blame. Look. There's you and Mum when I got the primary school prize. Remember? How long ago was that? Fifteen years? Seventeen and a half. She looks really nice, doesn't she? Tomorrow. Could be. Let's not cross our bridges till we have to. I'm trying to be ready to cross. I know. You could have run to say you were coming. I missed this vision. What? I'll go and wash it off. Come on. Didn't I ever tell you I was a hoarder? What made you decide to throw it all out? Well, I didn't actually decide. I thought I'd take a look at it all, see what was there. By the time I got started, it was too late. You're going to throw it all out? Might be some useful odds and ends in there. No. It's all going out lock, stock and barrel. Should I be reading something into this? Like what? Well... Look, I do understand the problem. From your point of view, I mean. Mike. You know when I used to tease you about being so conventional? Well, maybe that's my problem, too. I'm just too stuck in my ways. I'm too accustomed to having things the way I want them. I've been on my own too long, Mike. Live with me. 
But... But what? I'll marry you. I'd like to see the director, please. It's a missing persons inquiry, and I really do have to see him. As soon as possible. In fact, now. I think we know who he is. He's Alan James McCloy, a well-known London villain. I got onto the Met and they came through this morning. Now, this Alan James McCloy has got a country cottage on the other side of King's Markham. And the cottage has got an alarm system fitted by black stars, which must be how he met Charlie Hatton. That's got to be him, the real McCloy. Oh. <laughs> and where is this Alan James McCloy now? The matter onto it, going round all his usual horns. You know, I think that Cullum is in it too. Probably McCloy, you attacked him. You think so? And you don't? Not really. That's why we're going to Bournemouth, while the Met chase up this McCloy of yours. Bournemouth? What's that got to do? The Fanshawe's weekend. Look, what is all this about? Why don't you just tell me? Before this day is over, I will, one way or the other. But in the meantime, just bear with me, will you, Mike? Oh, by the way, Jenny and I are getting married. Oh. Well, I am delighted. Mike, well, I am delighted. <laughs> likely one of the missing girls no parents it seems no close relatives went missing at the right time and apparently looked quite like Nora Fanshawe Miss Lewis we know that you've been seen by a constable from the local station did he explain the problem to you no he just asked a lot of questions about Bridie Bridget I mean I see well uh, my colleague inspector Burden and I are looking into some recent cases of missing persons. We're especially interested in young women who have been reported missing in the South Coast area around six weeks ago. Like Bridget? Nurse Cole Ross, yes. You uh, might be able to help us because we believe that of all the staff in the clinic, you knew her best. Is that right? Yes, I suppose so. I mean, one didn't know her awfully well. We weren't much alike, really. I'd like to show you some items of hers which you might as identify as belonging to her. Could be. But I mean she smokes that brand of cigarettes but these things are all pretty common. You're positive? Absolutely. Oh God, yes. One heard enough about that bag. Had it flaunted. She was very proud of it. Who gave it to her? How did you know that it was a present? An expensive bag like that with cheap stuff in it. If she'd been able to afford a bag like that, she could have afforded a gold lighter to go in it. Don't you think? Who gave it to her? Jay. J, like the initial? Yes. Well, what was the rest of his name? Oh, it was all part of the game. It's a wonder she didn't call him Mr. X. What's happened to her? Where did you get these things? 
Alan. I'm afraid she's dead. She died in a car crash. Oh, the poor, stupid. Was uh, Jay her boyfriend? Hardly a boy, from what she said. He was middle-aged? Was he a married man? Yes. How do you know if she kept it secret? Oh, one used to pick up little hints and slips, just like a detective. I think it began when his wife came here for an operation. When Bridget met him, I mean. I'll check. When would this have been? Fifteen months. Eighteen. Oh, I'm not sure. Poor, stupid bridey. She was always so desperate for all the good things in life. Such as? Money. Money, money. Just like Charlie. Sorry, who? Doesn't matter. That being awkward. Patients' files being confidential and all that. Oh, I think they got a point, don't you? I suppose so. We'll be back. If their records show that Mrs. Fanshawe came here for some sort of operation 18 months ago, then we know who Jay was. Jay for Jerome. Jerome Fanshawe. But Mrs. Fanshawe couldn't have come here. Eighteen years ago, maybe, but not eighteen months ago. Why not? <laughs> so the girl in the car... Mrs. Fanshawe swears that there was no other person in the car. Whatever. We know who the dead girl was. We also know she had a middle-aged lover called Jay. Sounds like Fanshawe to me from everything you've told me about him. Well, if my theory is right, Jerome Fanshawe is the one person that couldn't be Jay. Is it about time we heard this private theory? I think I'd rather demonstrate it to you after our next appointment. Come on. Seated. If he's going to start telling us nice things about Charlie Hatton, we'll be here all day, won't we? Nothing funny about it, Mike. Charlie Hatton brought something special into the lives of all who knew him. As a husband to Lillian, as a friend to many, especially to Jack Pertwee. We mourn his tragic death at such an early age. But we must also give thanks for the great gift of friendship and affection which he bestowed so readily and openly on all of us. Demonstration now. What's happening? You got him yet, or is it still early days? Investigations are in progress. I'm glad to say. Something I want to find out about. Hello. Oh, do you know where I can find Dr. Crane? Dr. Crane. Oh, he's not here today. Wait to some conference or something. Thank you. 
Oh, Mr. Vigo. I was looking for Dr. Crane, but I'm sure you could answer my question. How can I help you? Well, uh, you remember when we first met in Dr. Crane's office, you made a remark about Sleeping Beauty. It was Mrs. Farnshaw, right, wasn't it? I don't remember that specifically, but it sounds like one of my jokes. Rather bad taste, I suppose. <laughs> Is she your patient? Well, no, I've never even seen the woman. But you know of her through Dr. Crane? Well, yes, most of the staff here did. And was it common knowledge amongst the staff that she was going to come out of her coma when she did? Well, it's not exactly my area of expertise, but Jerry went Jerry? around telling him... Dr. Crane? Jerry? Is that Jeremy or Gerald? Gerald. Thank you, Mr. Vigo. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Oh, Rip. Tests are negative. They've double-checked. You've got nothing to worry about. Well, I'll uh, see you later. Oh, I have to call Sheila. Oh, use my office. I'm glad you didn't take it all on yourself, after all. Did you find out what you wanted? Mm. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Have they found McCloy? Glad to have, sir. Where is he? Peterhead, sir. McCloy's been there for a couple of months. And on remand for six weeks before that. Did a bank job in Dundee. Don't have much luck with your suspects, do you, Mike? Keep dropping off the trees as soon as you point the finger at them. Oh, Sergeant Martin. Sir? Can you get me a couple of dubbies? You know, like you see in shop windows. I'll, uh, do my best, sir. Yeah, the old ones. You know, I want to knock them about a bit. Yes, sir. Oh, uh... Rigid or bendable, sir? Oh, uh, bendable. Sir. Oh, any uh, special colour, sir? Get on with it. Sir. I can just hear him and the rest of them out there. We want a couple of dummies when all we've got to do is look in the mirror. What do you want it for, this demonstration? Well, I'm going to put a suggestion of yours to the test. About the death of a girl we now know as Bridget Culross. A suggestion of mine? You see, Mike, the connection between uh, Charlie Hatton and the Fanshawes really bothered me. Charlie coming home late the night of the crash and then dying the night before Mrs. Fanshaw came out of her coma. But yesterday, when Len Crocker mentioned that somebody had come out of a coma and identified his attacker, the light began to dawn. And I got a really daft idea. Which is? that Charlie Hatton was killed because he was witness to a murder. The murder of Bridget Cull Ross. Or at least the disposal of her body. What about the suggestion of mine? I don't remember saying anything about Bridget Cull Ross. Oh, yes, you suggested it, all right. Yesterday, on the bypass, I asked you how the body could have wound up on the road if it wasn't in the car. Now, the problem is that I didn't take your reply seriously any more than you did. You said, well, maybe she fell off the back of a lorry. You mean she was in Jay's car with him and she fell out? No. She didn't fall. She was pushed, thrown. I'll show you.
Why would the head have been in Jay's lap? Well, he had to place it in his lap to avoid getting blood on the uh, upholstery. She was probably dead before he threw her out. Jay and Bridget probably had her own. He hit her. Maybe he didn't mean to kill her, but he did. So he had a corpse on his hands. Not only did he have to get rid of it, but he had to conceal how it happened. The only thing he didn't consider was that throwing her out on the road might cause an almighty accident. And it happened on that rather dangerous bit of the road, didn't it? Where people always try and drive too fast. Which would explain why Fanshawe didn't see the body till it was too late to slow down. Well, Fanshawe always drove like a madman. Both his wife and his daughter told us that. He was probably doing a hundred. There's scarcely any traffic about on the road at that time. So, Fanshawe sees the body directly ahead of him on the road. What the hell? What about her bag and the case? Oh, but they would have been thrown out with her, of course. Well, it's certainly ingenious. Oh, except it can't have happened that way. What do you mean? Well... For your theory to work, Jay must have been driving in the outside lane, right? So Bridget's body would end up on the inside lane. And then Fanshawe's driving up on the inside lane, sees the body, swerves to avoid it, and crashes. But according to the accident report, Fanshawe's car was in the outside lane when he crashed. So for your theory to work, Bridget's body would have had to be in the outside lane too, which indeed is where it was. But there's no way it could have got there. Jay would have had to have been driving in the central reservation. And, and those bushes make that impossible. Sorry, Reg. You drive the car, I've got some thinking to do. Do you mind stepping out, sir? And you too, sir. Sorry, Mr. Wexford. What's the problem? We had a call about something very odd going on over there. Didn't realize it was you. Sorry. Not your day for suspects either, is it? God, what do you want now? Just to return this. What, no more questions? No more lies about my poor Charlie. Well, there are a couple of questions, but perhaps this isn't the time. Ah, the law. Still plodding along. Sir? Don't need the law. Oh, go back inside there, Jack. It's me he's come to see. Isn't that right, Chief Inspector? Come in. Go on. Well? I am interested in one particular entry in the diary. Uh, January 16th. Here it is. It's the night your husband came home late. Excited. Didn't come to bed for hours. What about it? Can you remember anything that he said? But that was weeks ago. I can't remember what he said the day he died, before he went to Jack's stag night. Have you any idea what that's like? Not to be able to remember the last words he ever spoke to me. Business before pleasure. Guest of honor looks like he'd give his right arm some business to attend to. <laughs> Glad to see a smile on your face again. Quiet, please. Quiet, quiet. 
Can I have your attention? Now, on an occasion like this, there has to be a speech. Oh. And I'm the poor soul, so that has to make it. Okay. <laughs> I've worked with Mike Burden for a long time. And I know that you have uh, names that you call us behind our backs. <laughs> and as from today, I suppose it's going to be the dummies. <laughs> well, of course I worried about the money sometimes. But that was just Charlie. Oh, he adores me, you know. Oh, Marilyn. I don't know what I'm going to do without him. Now, this isn't a proper party, Mike. You'll have to give us more time to organize that, but on behalf of everyone here, I just want to say how pleased we are that you're marrying Jenny. Yay! And I want to wish you, oh, although I know that you won't need it, I want to wish you all the luck in the world. Same without Charlie. The day at school. And the them lads from the estate were gonna throw him in the pond. Just for a laugh. <laughs> Poor Charlie. Doesn't need me to stop and bully him now. Have you been trying your hand at surgery? Oh, not one of mine, Brett. I'd have to be driven to the limits of the Hippocratic Oath to treat anyone as stupid as that. He's been telling everybody it's a skiing accident. That didn't happen on the slopes. He picked up his car at the airport, forgot he was back in England, and drove out of the car park on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> What's this? Special treat for Mr. Burden, is she? Oh, God, they love it. Trust me. So, um, oh, come on, sit down and see as well. Come on, you the noise down, quiet! Quiet! Come on! Quiet! Keep it down. Mr. Burns, sir. Oh, uh, oh, oh, hey. oh, Telling you that for years, Red. Jay? Jay. I know about you and Bridget. I know what happened to Bridget. And I want money. Where can we meet?
is that you? Jay, is that you? It is you, isn't it? Jay. Lewis! You're all right now. You're safe now. I'm sorry, it was the only way we could flush him out. Mike, you're quite safe now. Julian Vigo, I arrest you for the murders of Bridget Carl Ross and Charles Hatton. You're not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so. But anything you say will be put in writing. Jay for Julian. When I realized how he'd done it, I checked with the Princess Louise Clinic. That's where Mrs. Vigo had their first child. And that's where Vigo met Bridget Cole Ross. They started an affair which went on until a few months ago. Then he got tired of her, and she threatened to go to his wife. Mrs. Vigo is the one with the money and the house. I think the idea of losing his second child just tipped him over the edge, and he had to get rid of Bridget Cole Ross. My God. I didn't realize I was that close to a murderer. And this Charlie character, he saw it. Did he see it? He recognized Vigo. <clears throat> Wonderful chance for blackmail, especially now that his other source of cash had dried up since his partner, McCloy, had gone down for a stretch. And that's why Vigo killed him, because he was being blackmailed? No, not exactly. Vigo's real problem was Mrs. Fanshawe. For all he knew, she'd tell us exactly what happened when she came out of that coma. So he had to kill Charlie before that happened. Sorry, I don't follow. As far as Vigo could see, he was going to have to get rid of Mrs. Fanshawe. Remember, he had no way of knowing that she was asleep before the crash. But if he did that while Charlie was still alive and well, Charlie would know that he was next on the list. And with his life in danger, Charlie would find a way of shopping Vigo to us out of sheer self-protection. So Vigo had to dispose of Charlie before he could shut Mrs. Fanshawe up for good? Tricky situation. No wonder Vigo left it as long as he did. He had to make sure that Charlie thought he was going to keep on paying him the money. Give him a sense of security. And then... I saw Vigo in the hospital the next morning, after killing Charlie. Probably making a last recce on Mrs. Fanshawe before killing her. <laughs> no wonder he looked pleased when he found out that she was asleep before the crash. End of problem, as far as he was concerned. You move. So how did Vigo do it? Kill Bridget? And how did Charlie Hatton recognize him driving past on the other side of the bypass at night? He didn't. He recognized the car. You probably saw it at uh, Vigo's house, same as I did. Vigo was using that American car of his. A left-hand drive Ford Mustang. That's how he managed to push the poor girl out of the passenger door and into the outside lane. You see, Crocker told me about Benson. He forgot which side of the road we drive on. You remove. Who's Benson? And what's he got to do with it? Well, he's a chap in plaster at the little party we gave for Mike. Now, are you going to move her, aren't you?
life and forgiven for keeping you in the dark. Suspended sentence. We have come together in the presence of God to witness the marriage of Michael and Jenny, to ask his blessing of them and to share in their joy. Our Lord Jesus Christ was a guest at a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and through his spirit he is with us now. The scriptures teach us that marriage is a gift of God in creation and a means of his grace, a holy mystery in which man and woman become one flesh. It is God's purpose. John, you worried about your speech? Oh, come on, don't be, it'll be fine. You're gonna say something about Mum. Good, I think you should, really. Jenny, we're ready. my wife and myself. Oh. <laughs> well, what are we doing here? I won't be a minute. Go back from your honeymoon. Two weeks in the sun. You hear we uh, got the man that killed your best friend. We wondered about Cullum. But it turned out to be more complicated than that. Don't need the law. What? Well, that's what you said. The last time I saw you. Don't worry. He'll come round. Six days, six weeks, six months, whatever. And then he'll tell us. He'll tell us what happened. My guess is you talked to George Carter. George Carter said he thought it was Cullum. So you went for Cullum. Of course. I can't prove it. Mr. Wexford. Anytime you want, pop into the station. Chief Inspector, you do look smart. Oh, thank you. 